I find myself living at a very particular point in the almost four billion years of the evolution of life on this planet. I feel lucky, no, extraordinarily privileged to be alive right now, when for the first time we are able to investigate terrestrial life on scales smaller than the size of atoms, as well as look to the skies for evidence of extraterrestrial life, many hundreds of light years beyond the planet that we currently live. This beauty, this complexity, this body of knowledge that we are creating as humans flies in the face of the second law of thermodynamics, which describes how things tend to become more rather than less disordered as time goes by. In spite of living in this physically unlikely era of human information creation, I feel that many of us are often not open to seeing the bigger picture. Perhaps because in this era of information inundation, we prefer or feel more comfortable forgetting how much we still don't know. I want to be the most improbable human that I can be. I am prepared to give up my life on Earth for the unprecedented contribution I would be able to make to the sum of human knowledge from a new world. I want to be one of the first citizens on Mars, and today I would like to talk about why. Quantum mechanics is our most fundamental theory of reality, dealing with phenomena occurring on scales far smaller than the resolution of the human eye, in objects like photons, atoms, electrons, to get an idea of just how small. The human hair is about a micrometer wide and is obviously visible by the human eye. A thousand times smaller than that is the DNA molecule with a width of a few nanometers, the helical structure of which was first observed only in 1952 using an X-ray imaging technique. Ten times smaller than that, and we arrive on the scale of atoms, best observed with a beam of electrons. Quantum biology. You may wonder what these two seemingly disparate fields have in common. Quantum mechanics, dealing with the kinds of objects I've just described, while biology, as we know, deals with macroscopic objects like elephants, which we can clearly see. However, the idea that quantum mechanics may play a role in living systems is by no means a new idea. On this very day, the 15th of August in 1932, one of the founders of quantum theory, Niels Bohr, delivered a lecture, Light and Life, at the International Congress on Light Therapy in Copenhagen. He questioned whether quantum mechanics may help us to understand life scientifically. In the audience was an intrigued Max Delbruck, a young physicist who went on to contribute to the establishment of the field of molecular biology. Both of these brilliant scientists won Nobel Prizes for their contribution to our understanding of reality. The most well-established area of quantum biology is the study of the very early stages of photosynthesis, up to the first billionth of a second. Only recent developments in an experimental technique called ultra-fast spectroscopy have enabled us to image processes happening on such quick timescales. These very early stages of photosynthesis are almost perfectly efficient and we would like to understand how nature does it quite so well. It turns out we need quantum mechanics to do so. Understanding photon by photon, molecule by molecule, how photosynthesis works is a necessary step towards developing biologically inspired artificial photosynthetic systems that can produce more food and harness more sunlight energy than is possible with currently existing technologies. So, while quantum biology promises to contribute to the kinds of new technologies essential for our continued existence on this planet and perhaps others, in my opinion, the most grand or meaningful contribution that quantum biology could make would be if it could help us in some way to answer that question that we have been asking since time immemorial. What is life? What is the difference between a living system and the bunch of matter that it is made of? And how did it emerge? While instinctively we are good at telling the difference between a living creature and a bunch of inanimate molecules, scientifically we are still trying to develop a theory on what precisely distinguishes these two things and how did life emerge in the first place. So I thought it was quite funny that that ethanol molecule looks quite similar to that horse, but I'm not taking that as a clue. Uh, <laughs> what would be very helpful in terms of understanding the fundamental principles underlying the emergence of life would be to find just one other instance of the phenomenon. So far, in a vast universe, we are the only living systems that we know of, and when I say we, I'm talking from bacteria up to humans. 
this is a very unlikely place and time in which we find ourselves. So astrobiology is the study of the origin, evolution, distribution, and future of life in the universe, and the universe is a big place. We measure the distances in the universe in terms of the uh, distance that light travels in a given time, light being the fastest thing that we know of in our current understanding. Light travels at almost 300,000 kilometers every second in vacuum. So while Mars is just a few light minutes away, light takes four years to get to the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, around a thousand years to get to that recently discovered intriguingly Earth-like planet called Kepler-452b, millions of years to reach the nearest galaxy, Andromeda, and almost 50 billion years to reach the edge, the furthest edge of the observable universe. There's a theory with a crazy name, panspermia, that says that life on Earth emerged when the necessary building blocks of life, already present in space, were delivered to the suitable environment by objects like meteorites. When we consider that a range of building blocks of life have been discovered in these meteorites, which we found on the surface of the Earth, the theory doesn't sound so crazy. For example, in the Murchison meteorite, which fell to Australia in 1969, over 70 different types of amino acids were detected. We would like to use the tools from quantum theory to try and understand how these precursors of life emerged in space in the first place, just one of the steps in the journey towards understanding life. Now, if you're feeling mentally exhausted, you should be, that's the point. I've just taken you on a journey from the tiny scales where atoms exist out to the furthest edges of the universe, many billions of light years away. That is a big picture. And a picture I spend a lot of time inside as a researcher in quantum mechanics, quantum biology, and recently in a field I would like to call quantum astrobiology. The point I want to make is that what we are doing here on Earth as living systems, and in particular as humans, is extremely improbable. In a vast universe, we represent the only example that we know of so far. We're collections of molecules, because that's what we are, have observed reality, made sense of it through language, found ways to record and communicate this information, which has culminated in the internet, in my opinion, one of our finest moments. This is an unlikely time and place which we all find ourselves in right now. So what I find perplexing is that in spite of living in this grand era of human existence, and in spite for many of us of having the sum of human knowledge at our fingertips, Many people find it overwhelming, unnerving, and indeed incomprehensible that I want to move to Mars on a one-way trip. Billions of years of evolution of life on Earth have resulted in this precise moment when for the first time, the proposal to move to another planet is becoming a reality. Untold discoveries lie in wait, including the possibility of finding evidence of life on Mars. Finding evidence of life on Mars would be a giant leap in terms of understanding who we are, where we come from, and where we are going. I have volunteered and been shortlisted along with 99 others from around the planet to move to Mars in 10 years' time. I am prepared... <laughs> Thank you. I am prepared to give up my life on Earth for this adventure, this idea, this achievement that will not be my own, but that of all humanity. I'm even prepared to give up coming back to Earth. What I would like to point out, first of all, is that we are all survivors of one-way trips, no matter where on the surface of the Earth we happen to currently live. Homo sapiens, according to the fossil record, emerged in central eastern Africa around 200,000 years ago, and we have been exploring the surface of the planet ever since. My ancestors arrived in 1688 on a five-month trip from Europe to the southernmost tip of Africa. I am now the 11th generation of French Huguenot refugees, now proudly South African. And in the same way, I imagine in 500 years' time, there may well be human Martians telling a similar tale of the perilous journey their ancestors made from Earth in the early 21st century. Secondly, I would like to point out that all the information we have gathered, all the observations we have made, have resulted from exploring the unknown. The devices, the technologies that you find so indispensable in your daily life are the result of having investigated something new. I like to think of the heat engine as the eventual technological solution to the bad weather that the first African explorers encountered when they first moved north and discovered Europe. 
In the same way, I hope that the relatively hostile environment on Mars will lead to new technologies that will not only support life on Mars, human life, but I also believe will uh, influence our technologies on Earth and towards developing things like solar renewable energy, um, using resources better than we currently do, and trying to combat climate change and the poverty in which so many of us live. Life on Mars will be a precious and fragile resource, and I believe morality there will be defined by a deep appreciation for life, and all that's needed to sustain it, and I believe that this attitude will filter back down to Earth. This is what we have always done, and this is what we will continue to do. We observe, we dream, and we expand our horizons through the realization of these dreams. I want to make the best contribution of which I am possible to the sum of human knowledge. I want to be one of the first human minds to know what it is like in a completely new world. I am prepared to sacrifice my life on Earth to contribute to the establishment and possibly the discovery of evidence of life on Mars. To conclude, this is an unlikely time in which we find ourselves and we should feel privileged to live right now when the possibility to expand our imaginations and our world further than ever before is within reach. In the end, it's simple. I want to go to Mars because, to me, the allure of the unknown has always felt far more powerful than the comfort of the known. Thank you for your attention.